so let's uh, let's jump in here. So can I ask so many people here? It's been nice to see so many people. <laughs> it's good. Is there anyone who has who's the first time on this kind of retreat? Or? Yeah, okay. Oh, I've quite a few of you. Okay, so you have never seen me before? You've never heard me speak before? No idea what I'm talking about? Okay, good. So welcome. <laughs> Special welcome to you. So I will just give you a little bit of background so you have some idea of what this kind of retreat is about and, yeah, and kind of what the purpose of this is and so that you understand what we're going to do here. And uh, the idea, with it's obviously a lot of emphasis on teaching and on this retreat, there's a little bit of meditation, there's a little bit of a different kind of retreat. And one of the things in Buddhism is that there is a lot of scope for doing things in different kind of ways. And yeah, some uh, retreats are like meditation retreats, the emphasis on just on meditation. Yeah. Other ones are more like a mix, uh, yeah, and other ones are more kind of emphasis on teaching, yeah. And this is a little bit like a mix, but also a little bit of emphasis on the teaching aspect. Uh. And when we teach the uh, the Dhamma, the teach the teaching of the Buddha, one of the things that I have always liked to do is to teach actually the word of the Buddha himself. Uh. And this is the emphasis on this retreat is actually going back to the. Uh, suttas, uh, what we call the early Buddhist texts. Uh, yeah, these are the texts that go back to the uh, time of the Buddha himself. Uh, and go back to those to understand what the Buddha actually was teaching. Yeah. Because one of the things that I have noticed in the Buddhist world is that we tend to be what is called following the Acharya Vada. And the Acharya Vada, Acharya means teacher, yeah, and Vada means like doctrine. Yeah. So we tend to be followers of teachers, uh, following the doctrines of various kind of teachers. And then these teachers can be uh, this, you know, this uh, venerable so and so, this ayah so and so, uh, master so and so, Rinpoche so and so. Yeah, everyone has a teacher in the world, uh, but very few people take the Buddha as their teacher. Uh, if you ask someone who is your teacher, nobody says the Buddha. <laughs> Have you noticed that? That just doesn't happen. Uh, and this is a big mistake in the Buddhist world. It's a big mistake because uh, all teachings that we have in Buddhism, uh, they only have value insofar as they relate to the teaching of the Buddha. Uh, if the teaching you hear relates in the right way to the teaching of the Buddha, then it is a valid teaching. Uh, then it makes sense. Uh, so everything needs to be seen in relation to the Buddha because the Buddha is the one who started the Buddhist teachings. Yeah? If the Buddha didn't understand, if the Buddha got it all wrong, well then we don't have any Buddhism. So the Buddha, we have to assume the Buddha knew what he was talking about. Uh, so this is the most important teachings in all of Buddhism, are the teachings of the Buddha. And that is why it is very useful to go back to the original source uh, and actually understand what the Buddha himself taught. Uh, so this is kind of the idea behind these kind of retreats, to try to understand, unravel if you like, uh, get an appreciation of uh, uh, how the Buddha made these teachings available to the world. Uh, and that is what I'm hoping to do, and please uh, keep me to that, and if you think that I have a misunderstanding, because obviously when I teach, uh, I'm going to add to the word of the Buddha, so if you think that maybe I have misunderstood, or maybe you think there is a an alternative understanding, you're very welcome to say so. And then we can have a discussion about these teachings. Yeah? I'm not going to get upset if you disagree with me, I promise. <laughs> and I, so you're very, very welcome to, have, to disagree with me if, if you wish. And um, uh, then, kind of coming from that, hopefully we will gain a better understanding of what these teachings are all about. Yeah? This is kind of the, uh, uh, the purpose behind this. This particular retreat is called uh, uh, practicing like the Buddha, is that what I call it? Uh, something like that? How to practice like the Buddha? Okay. And um, the uh, idea behind this is that one of the things that you find in these suttas of the Buddha is you find the Buddha talking about his own life, yeah, his own practice. Uh, and especially he talks about what he did himself before he reached awakening. Yeah. Yeah, and these suttas, actually quite a large number of them, especially in the Majjhima Nikaya, you find uh, the Buddha talking about how he was thinking before his awakening, how he was thinking while he was still living in lay life, uh, what were the motivating factors that made him renounce the household life and become the Buddha. That is very interesting, yeah? what motivated the Buddha. I think this is a very interesting thing, and this is where we get into the ideas about you know, things like the Bodhisattva, 
and, uh, and right intention, and all of these kind of issues arise out of that. Uh, and so there's lots of suttas uh, about the Buddha talking about his own life, uh, especially before he became the Buddha. And uh, the reason why the Buddha is talking about these things uh, is because he wants to inspire us. Uh, yeah, he wants to say, this is how I practiced. Uh, because I practice in this way, because I am a human being, uh, because I also have weaknesses. This is what the Buddha says, we shall see this later on. He also has weaknesses that are very similar to the weaknesses that we have. Uh, not the Buddha, but the Buddha to be before he became enlightened. Uh, and because this is how, what I did, uh, you should be practicing in the same way. Uh. And this is a very important part of the idea of the Buddhist teaching, that when the Buddha teaches uh, and when he talks about his own life be before his awakening, uh, he is a human being just like us. Uh. Yeah, he's not a god, he's not some kind of cosmic principle. Uh. A lot of the ideas of later Buddhism where the Buddha gets elevated way in the, in the wrong kind of way. Everything becomes miraculous. Everything becomes over the top. Uh, all of that actually detracts from our understanding of the Buddha. The Buddha was a human being. Yeah, and that is why his teachings, uh, his way of exposition, uh, his very practice before his awakening, all of that is relevant to us. Uh, if the Buddha was fundamentally different from us, then these teachings would not really be relevant to us. Uh, this is a very, very important point. Uh, and so we're going to look at how the Buddha himself practiced before his awakening. That's the idea behind this uh, uh, sequence, a series of talks. And uh, it's going to be around the idea of the Noble Eightfold Path. Yeah? Because everything in the end comes back to the Noble Eightfold Path. Uh, and I'd like to look at this from all kinds of angles. Uh, this is going to be the Noble Eightfold Path uh, from the angle of how the Buddha to be practiced this path. Uh, Yes, yeah, so this is kind of the. I always try to kind of come up with some slightly different idea just to make it interesting. If I do the same thing every year, I don't know if you would you get bored or would you still be okay? Huh? <laughs> some people still okay. Some people start yawning. Oh, whatever. Oh, same old, same old. Okay, it's going to be the same old, same old this time as well, but from a slightly different angle, just to have you warned. Yes, yeah, so you know what's going on there. And if you do find that. I should also say at the beginning, if you do find that you get really bored and you think that this monk, he says the same thing every time, whoa, I really... Yes, please. Ah. Zoom by audio, what, what do you mean? Oh, I haven't joined the audio. Ooh, okay. Okay. All right, thank you. It's a good thing that we have people who can look after this. So, so uh, excellent. Thank you so much, Ang. Um, so, I remember that the idea of coming on a retreat like this is to enjoy yourself. Yeah, please enjoy yourself. It's so important uh, because Buddhism should be something that actually enhances the quality of our life. Uh, when you come to meditate, when you come to listen to the Dhamma, when you come to all of these kind of things, uh, Make sure that you have a good time, yeah? If you think this is too boring, please walk out any time, yeah? You're very welcome to walk out. I'm not going to write your name down. I don't know your name anyway, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> uh, and because uh, it's about relaxing and having a good time together, being with the Buddha, the Dhamma, it should be uplifting, yeah? We should feel good about this. Uh, and if you feel tired, it's natural. You all have very busy lives. If you feel a bit tired, you want to take the afternoon off, please take the afternoon off. Please take the morning off if you want to sleep in. I don't care at all. To me, the most important thing is that you enjoy yourself. If you enjoy yourself, I will enjoy myself. If I enjoy myself, you will enjoy ourselves. Let's have a good time together. That's kind of the, uh, the background behind this. Uh, and then, hopefully, we'll be able to uh, learn something. You learn something when you are relaxed, right? Uh, you know that famous saying of Ajahn Brahm? Ajahn Brahm likes to tell many jokes. Uh, you, <laughs> were you here when Ajahn Brahm was here in... Uh, in December? Uh, yeah, yes, some of you were. Okay, not everyone. Not everyone was here. So this is kind of Ajahn Brahm saying, Ajahn Brahm, I don't know if this is just an excuse or whatever, but uh, this is what he, Ajahn Brahm has many, I don't know if it, I should say he has an excuse, but uh, unmute. Okay, so now unmute. <laughs> okay, so the um, uh, the 
idea here is like what Ajahn Brahm says, that he's, he says this is like a Tibetan saying. Yeah? The Tibetan saying is that when you, uh, you make people laugh uh, and when their mouth is open, you throw in the pillow of wisdom. Huh? You know that? Uh, this is kind of the idea. And of, it's true, right? Because when you laugh, you're relaxed, you're at ease, you're enjoying yourself, and that's when you are open to take in the Dhamma properly. Huh? So very important to actually find that sense of relaxation. And this is one of the things I love about Ajahn Brahm. Ajahn Brahm is very informal. Yeah? He likes to kind of, for everyone to have a good time and enjoy themselves. Uh, and it's one of the things I, I try to follow myself. So if I get too serious, tell me off. Uh, yeah? Too serious, okay, no good. <laughs> so please, uh, please, uh, this is the way I like to do things. Uh. So on that basis, uh, now let's start to have a look at these particular suttas. Uh, and as I said, it's going to be basically based on the idea of the Noble Eightfold Path uh, from the perspective of the life of the Buddha himself. Uh. And I'm just going to do the important business of pouring the coffee. Uh. <laughs> yeah. Priorities, priorities. Uh. Maybe, maybe you think this is craving. This is good craving. I'm just letting you know. There's, there's good craving and bad craving. <laughs> <laughs> and so because it is based on the idea of the Noble Eightfold Path, uh, the very beginning here we're going to start to look at the idea of right view. Yeah, what is right view on this path? Uh, and we're going to look specifically about how the Buddha, uh, the Buddha-to-be, uh, how he gave rise to right view, right understanding, and then from that, how the path unfolded. This is kind of the idea behind this. Uh, and this first sutta we're going to have a look at is known as the Arya Pariyasana Sutta, which translates into English as the Noble Search. Yeah, so the Noble Search. Sounds quite nice, doesn't it? Uh, noble Search. I know. I, some of these words in the Dhamma are actually very very powerful, evocative words. They're like noble, for example. Yeah? There's something very beautiful about the idea of being noble. Noble is something elevated. Yeah? N of course, nobility of the heart, not nobility of external things. Uh, and that's some there's something yeah, beautiful about that. Uh, anyway, so I'm going to, as I usually do, I'm going to read out a little bit. Uh, and you can see it on the screen over there. You have the English on the left side. And then you have the Pali on the right side, so we can refer to the Pali quite easily. This is taken from the website called uh, suttacentral.net. Uh, and this is where you can actually you can format the text almost exactly the way you like. You can either, either have just the Pali or just the English. You can have Pali English together. You can have Pali on top, or English on top, Pali underneath. You can do all these kind of things. Uh, and then you have tools that help you translate the Pali. There's all kind of stuff available on this website. Uh, and it is becoming the world's number one website for the suttas. Uh, so very, very beautiful uh, and powerful website in that way. Uh, so this is what, uh, how this goes. And this uh, is uh, a story, or the, uh, not, maybe not a story is the wrong word. This is an occasion where the Buddha has gone to the monks. Uh, the monks are hanging out at the hermitage, uh, and the Buddha has gone to them. And he, uh, because he has been asked to give them a talk, so he comes uh, and uh, then he says this to the monk. He says, good mendicants, uh, it is appropriate for gentlemen like you uh, who have gone forth in faith from lay life to homelessness uh, to sit together and talk about the teaching. Uh, when you're sitting together, you should do one of two things. Uh, discuss the teaching or keep noble silence. Uh, yeah, so the Buddha has just had a chat with them, and after having the chat, he says, Good mendicants. Uh, yeah, mendicant is a word. I don't know if you're familiar with this word mendicant. Uh, uh, the word mendicant is like an old-fashioned English word, uh, which means someone who depends on arms. Uh, yeah, someone depends on the generosity of other people. Uh, and in that sense, it is very similar in meaning to the word bhikkhu or bhikkhuni. Uh, Bhikkhu or bhikkhuni also means someone who depends on arms. Yeah? So it's very, very similar in that sense. So it's a very appropriate word, even though it is a bit old-fashioned. Uh. And then uh, he says, it is appropriate for gentlemen like you. Yeah? Gentlemen, is that an... <laughs> is that a, wow, 
how, doesn't that sound a little bit too like modern kind of English, like people are going back to England or something? <laughs> But the idea here is that the, uh, the Pali word is actually kulaputta. You can see the word kulaputta there. And the word kulaputta means someone in ancient India who kind of came from a good family. Yeah? These are people from good families. And, gen and gentlemen, or gentlewoman if you like, uh, these are also about people who come from good families. Uh, people who are polite, people who know how to uh, treat others in the right way. Yeah? People who have a sense of... Uh, idea of how uh, to, to live in the world in a positive way. That's like a gentleman or a gentlewoman or a gentle person, if you wish. Uh, so it is kind of appropriate. Uh, and it's interesting how this word is used, yeah, the idea of kulaputta, because in a sense it is, uh, uh, what it means is like the Buddha in a sense is praising them a little bit, says, yeah, you gentlemen, you good people. Uh, and he's already kind of uh, saying something positive to get the attention of the monastics in the crowd. Yeah, you are gentle people. You are good people. He's reminding themselves of the good qualities inside of them, huh, in a sense. Huh. And this is a very important thing to do. Huh. When you give a Dhamma talk, you want the audience to be relaxed and at ease. Yeah? You want to remind them of their good qualities, so that when you are reminded of your own good qualities, uh, you will try to live up to those good qualities. Huh. If people tell you off and tell you that you're all bad people, yeah, what, you only keep five precepts, you should keep six, seven, yeah, eight precepts. You should all be novices, yeah. What do you mean, you're lay people, you know, get ordained, get, <laughs> or whatever. But that's kind of the wrong approach. The right attitude to deal with people is to remind them, actually, you're doing really well. You have good intentions. You're trying to practice in the right way, yeah. Good on you for doing this. Good on you is like an Australian expression, which means like, well done, and then when you see the positive in other people, uh, then actually you tend to encourage those qualities in other people when you see the positive. Uh. And this is almost like what the Buddha is doing here. Yeah, Listen, you are good people. You have done the right thing. You have done something difficult. You have gone forth from good families. Yeah, You're not kind of the bottom of the hierarchy in society. You're already at the top, uh, and still you have gone forth. Uh. What a wonderful thing that is. Uh. And this is one of those things that I think is very important in the Buddhist teaching, to remember that uh, it doesn't matter which part of society you are from. Uh, yeah? It is not like the Dhamma is only for the kind of people on the bottom of society, yeah, they don't have any hope anyway, they might as well become monks and nuns. Yeah? It is not like that. Uh, the point of the Dhamma is that it is so profound, it is for everyone. Uh, so, um, but the idea is that uh, it doesn't matter what your background is, it is always worthwhile to become a monastic. Yeah? And uh, it shows to me, you know, when people say that, you know, oh, my son and daughter, they are a doctor, they are a lawyer, they're doing really well, they should make the family proud. We don't want you to become a monk or nun, that's the last thing we want, right? Uh, what that shows me, they haven't really understood what the Dhamma is about. Uh, if you have a son and daughter who is very successful, who is very bright, who is very intelligent, who has all the good qualities, that is specifically when you should encourage them to become a monk or nun, yeah. Because they are the ones who can make a difference in the world. They are the people who can express the Dhamma, who can articulate the Dhamma in such a way to make it meaningful for the whole world. They can become a great benefit for themselves and for others. Would you rather have your, uh, your son and daughter to become like the new Buddha or the new Ajahn Brahm, or would you like, like them to become some kind of doctor which gets forgotten straight away? What would, you, what would you prefer? Yeah, the idea is if you can help a large number of people in the world as well as helping yourself, that is the greatest thing we can do in our life. So I'm always very happy when I hear Buddhists who say, yeah, I want my children, yeah, or my hus even my husband and wife, please become a monk or a nun. Yeah? When I hear that, I think, yeah, you have really got it. Well done. And uh, that is what is the right attitude, I think, for a Buddhist. It means you understand what the Dhamma is about. This is where happiness is to be found. This is where meaning is to be found. Real meaning in life uh, is to be found on the spiritual path. Uh. So the idea of kulaputta uh, is a very important, uh, uh, is actually a meaningful thing. And I think gentleman, or maybe gentle person, would have been a better way of putting this, uh, uh, because it also includes women as well. Uh, and that would be the right way to think about this. So, yeah, it's appropriate for a gentle person who has gone forth in faith or out of faith from the lay life to homelessness. 
Yeah, so here we have the idea of faith. You don't just go forth from lay life into houselessness or homelessness, but you do it for the right reason. There's many different reasons for going forth. Yeah, one reason is that you are a no-hoper, you are a loser in society. Actually, Ajahn Brahm says being a loser is great. Yeah? Losers are the best people. The more you lose, the better it is. But uh, let's say you have, you have no hope. Yeah? You have no intelli you're not intelligent. You, you can't get a job. And kind of your parents are kind of despairing. What are we going to do with this? All my other sons and daughters, they are really bright and sharp. But this dum-dum here, don't know what to do with them. Uh, okay, go for it. Yeah, become, a mo become a monastic. Yeah? And uh, that is kind of not a very good reason. Huh? And one of the things that you find at the time of the Buddha, people became monastics for all kinds of reasons. Yeah? How to just have enough food, yeah, so we can just really relax and enjoy ourselves because we have all these illnesses and the, uh, and the Buddha has a good doctor, so we go forth just to get rid of the illnesses. Uh. And these are all reasons why people went forth. Uh. But actually the real reason to go forth, uh, the real reason that actually is powerful and fruitful and gives great rise to great results in the future, is if you go forth because of faith. Yeah, the Pali word is sadha. This is the right reason. So, what does it mean to go forth because of faith? What is this word faith, this word sadha? You can see sadha there in the, in the Pali on the, on the right-hand side. What does this word actually mean? And this is a very important word on the Buddhist path. And it has two fundamental meanings. And I was arguing with Bhante Sujata whether we should translate. Bhante Sujata is the translator of this one. You may never have heard of him, but he is a monk. Yeah, he's out there. He's a good friend of mine. Some of you have heard of him. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so he, um, uh, should, should it be translated as confidence or should it be translated as faith? Yeah, they go forth out of confidence in the teaching of the Buddha or out of faith in the teaching of the Buddha. And the question is, what is the difference between confidence and faith? And the answer is that both of these translations are correct. Confidence is correct and faith is correct. But there is no really acceptable English word that actually captures the idea of sadha fully. In the suttas, we often talk about this idea that you have, when you have faith, you have what is called Dhamma Veda and Atta Veda. And Veda, this is a word that means something like inspiration. It means both the fact of understanding the teaching, but also the fact of having an emotional connection to the teaching. What does it mean to be inspired, right? When you are inspired, it means that you understand something. Wow, this is really cool. I understand. And you feel inspired by your understanding. But inspiration also has an emotional component to it, right? When you are inspired to have to do something, you feel like an emotional sense of uplift. You feel good. You feel positive. Inspiration is a very beautiful quality because it combines understanding and emotional uplift together. And this is the idea of sadha. When you have sadha in the Buddha, you have confidence because you understand these teachings. You know that they apply to human beings. You know how important they are for your life, for your happiness, because you understand what is going on. So you have confidence that this really makes sense. Yeah? The Buddha is saying something sensible here. Yes, we have defilements. These are problematic. This is how you overcome these problems. This is how you purify yourself. Purity leads to happiness. All of these things start to make sense. Welcome. <laughs> Please. And when you start to see that these things make sense, and you start to feel that they apply to your own life, uh, then you also feel the sense of uplift. Uh, you feel inspired. You feel that you are... Uh, the, the idea of faith, faith in the sense of uh, um, feeling joyful and glad because you have come across something very profound and something beautiful, this arises together with the confidence and the understanding. Uh, yeah? So you have the faith side, which is the emotional side of this, uh, which lifts you up, which gives you a sense of... Uh, uh, joy and happiness on this path. And then there's the confidence side, which is the understanding side. And this idea of faith in Buddhism is very unique to the Buddhist teachings. Uh, because very often in the spiritual world around us, or, or the religious world, uh, usually when we talk about the idea of faith, it means like just following something because you have faith. It doesn't have anything to do with understanding at all. Uh. You just follow along, you believe in God. Why? Well, you just believe in God. That's all, you know. It's, 
doesn't have to make sense. Actually, sometimes it's better not to make sense, they say. Uh, and to me, that's kind of crazy. How can you not make sense? <laughs> that's to me, that's kind of really an awful idea. Uh, but in Buddhism, it's actually the opposite. In Buddhism, the idea of faith and confidence go together. Uh, the more confidence you have because it makes sense, uh, because you know it applies to your life, uh, the more inspired you are, the greater is the emotional connection to these teachings. Uh, and when you gain that emotional connection, that's when it becomes powerful. Uh, yeah, because then you start to reflect, as I was saying before, how fortunate I am to be here with my Kalyana Mittas, uh, how fortunate I am to have these marvelous teachings of the Buddha, and then you feel joy also in your meditation practice. Uh, and that joy that you feel in your meditation practice, well, that is precisely the thing that aids the meditation and makes the whole path come alive. Uh, so sadha, going forth because of faith, is such an important thing here. And so this is something that we should all try to develop in our life, yeah? develop this idea of sadha, because this is what will drive the process of meditation, drive the path forward. Yeah? So we're gonna, uh, this is now we're going to come looking at the idea of right view, and the idea of right view is very closely related to the idea of faith and confidence and sadha, yeah? because when you have sadha, when you have faith and confidence, uh, then of course you also take the ideas of the Buddha seriously, the idea of right view. So you have confidence in the teachings, you look at the Buddhist idea of right view, because you have confidence, you reflect on those things, you contemplate them carefully, huh? and as you do that, this idea of right view gets established within you as a consequence. So faith is a very important foundation for right view to arise. So how can we give rise to faith then in these teachings? Yeah, just to give you some very brief ideas about how faith comes about, uh, or confidence comes about. Uh, now, one of the very important things is to do what we're doing now. Yeah? Coming here, listening to the word of the Buddha, seeing if it really applies. Uh, what does it mean in my life? Uh, how does it actually give more meaning? How does it give rise to happiness? Uh, how does it give rise to the overcoming of suffering? All of these things uh, are a very important part of this. Uh, so as we do this, uh, as we go through these teachings, uh, I hope at the end of these five days you will have more faith, uh, more confidence than when you started out. Uh, if you have less faith and confidence after these five days, uh, I will have failed. Uh, pl please don't allow me to fail, right? <laughs> I want to succeed. So then we're going to be on the right track. Yeah? So please try to understand these teachings, start to understand how, what they mean for your particular, in your particular situation. And as you do that, uh, then this idea of faith will arise. Uh, then, as you start practicing these teachings uh, and you continue, continue to study them, uh, the more you understand how they apply to your life, how you practice them, uh, the more faith and confidence is likely to arise. Uh, so keep on reflecting. Uh, Keep on listening to Dhamma talks that are based on the sutta, that are conformed with the way the sutta are spoken. Practice the teachings in the right way, and as you do that, gradually this confidence will start to arise. And this is the right way to deal with this. So, time is going fast. So let's just do, the idea here is not to talk too much on my part. So... Uh, Let's just do a little bit of meditation. It's kind of just to allow things to sink in a little bit. Uh, and we can do a few questions afterwards, and then we'll just carry on.
<clears throat> okay. All right, so, uh, and usually at this point, I would like to give you the opportunity to ask some questions if you like, or make some comments about what we have been doing so far. So please feel free to, uh, to ask yeah, or uh, comment or whatever you, you would like. Yeah. If you'd like to ask questions, please raise your hands. We pass you the mic. Good morning, Ajahn. Hello. Hello, my name is Bodhi. Yeah. Ah, there you are. Okay, good. Yeah. <laughs> Trying to find you. Yeah. yeah, with regard to uh, Sada, yeah. there is some term like unwavering uh, confidence. Yeah. Uh, is that a sutta like Chanki Sutta best explain about how to arrive at uh, unwavering confidence? Yeah. Can you explain more about that, if yes? Yeah, yeah. So the, uh, the the idea about uh, faith or sadda is that it um, it grows over time. Yeah, and the idea is that to and this is kind of interesting. The more right view you have, the more wisdom you have, the more the faith and confidence grow. They go together, because if you see that the teaching of the Buddha works, if it gives rise to the result that it says, obviously your confidence is going to become stronger, right? So faith, insight, right view, wisdom are all sides of the same coin in Buddhism, which is kind of very interesting. It's very, it's very unique to the Buddha's teaching that these things are actually basically the same idea. I think it's almost unique in the religions of the world that these things are revolve around the same thing here. And then there comes a point when you have the full insight into the teaching of the Buddha. That's what stream entry is about, sotapanna is about, yeah? When you see the teaching fully. When you see the teaching fully, that's when all, when confidence becomes uh, Complete, yeah, because you know that this is, uh, because you have the same insight, you know that what the Buddha taught in the suttas must be correct, must be true. Because you have the full insight, your confidence becomes unwavering. Yeah? You know exactly what is going on. Uh, so that is another way of talking about stream entry. Because you have seen the reality, you have full faith, full confidence. Uh, so when your wisdom reaches the pinnacle, when your right view reaches the pinnacle, Confidence and faith also reach its pinnacle. Uh, that's why it's called unwavering. It reaches the kind of maximum point. Uh, it actually goes beyond that, but that's when it becomes kind of uh, you know solidified, if you like. Yeah. That's the idea with unwavering confidence. In the meantime, our job is to keep on increasing it uh, until it kind of reaches that to that point, basically. Yeah. Yes, please. Uh. Uh, I have a question to ask. Regarding um, Sata. Yeah. Now, there are explanations using the word faith, and you have added another one called confidence. Um, I have also heard of an explanation using the word devotion. Devotion? Yeah. So it's. Uh, Devotion, a uh, uh, right <laughs> term to use, or it's yeah. just another explanation. That's right. Uh, I, um, you know, the thing is that there is no right term. There are just different translations, and all of them, not maybe not all of them, many of them are pointing to something that is true, part part of the truth. Uh, and so sometimes when you read, I know that when you are reading the suttas and you see different people giving different translations, sometimes you feel really you feel you give up. What is true? I want to know the right one. Yeah, I don't want to see all those different ones. I want to see the right one. But actually, once you get used to the suttas, you should be very happy that people translate it in different ways because it gives you different angles on the meaning of the Pali. Yeah? Especially when a term like sadda, which is quite a complex term and quite difficult to capture with one word, when you see different angles, it actually gives you a more complete understanding of the term. So devotion is true. Yeah, it is also a good is also an appropriate translation because devotion is has to do with the heart quality. Yeah, it has to have to, how you feel inside. And if you bow down to the Buddha or you bow down to the Dhamma 
and you bow down with a heart full of confidence, you can give rise to joy. You can feel ha so happy just bowing down to the Buddha. And that's a beautiful thing to do that. Uh, because that is actually becomes a power in your meditation, in your whole practice. Uh, Ajahn Brahm tells the story of, uh, this is a story, I think I told it here before, but it's a story of, uh, you know, he, he was dreaming. I don't know how this is possible, but this is, this is what happens when you're like Ajahn Brahm. Yeah, I don't, not possible for ordinary people, but for Ajahn Brahm, possible. And uh, he says he was dreaming, and in this dream, uh, he was bowing down to this monk who he respected a lot. Uh, and because he was bowing down to this monk who he respected a lot, uh, he felt so much joy. Uh, yeah? And that joy was so powerful that kind of he started to go into samadhi in his dream. And because samadhi has so much happiness, he just woke up. And as soon as he woke up, the mind was so incredibly bright, bang, straight into deep meditation straight away. Uh, yeah? And this is kind of the idea of the idea of devotion or having a sense of faith that you feel so happy to be in the presence of such powerful and beautiful teachings uh, that you feel overwhelmed by joy and happiness. Uh. I mean, usually people in the world, they feel joy and happiness because they have some kind of promotion in their job or they have a new girlfriend. Yeah, yeah, new girlfriend. Wow, so happy. It's nothing, right? <laughs> it's small beer. The real happiness in life comes on the spiritual path. Uh, I mean, it's nice to have a nice girlfriend, a boyfriend. I'm not going to kind of be too kind of stupid monk kind of person. Uh, it's nice, but it's still a small thing compared to what is available on the spiritual path. Uh, and that is why, that is where the real powerful joy can arise as a consequence. And that is why devotion also is one angle on this idea of sadha. So, yes indeed. So thank you for bringing that up. Uh. Yes, please, fire away here. Yeah. <laughs> Meditation is just uh, as though as uh, resting the armchair. But what, what a technique you use for this meditation? Should we uh, just concentrate on uh, our breathing? Mm -hmm. Or should we concentrate only on positive thoughts? You should concentrate on, uh, on relaxing. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah, because I'll, I will tell, let me, I'll, I'll expand on that a little bit. Because uh, it is a very important point of meditation practice that people don't usually quite understand and that is that very often people go to the breath too quickly yeah but this is something that you learn in certain meditation techniques certain meditation ways is that you sit down you go to the breath straight away and uh, so please please just, just take my hand take it over here yeah you want to come, come on this side it's easy for you you can just uh, you can work here I can talk over here yeah, yeah. <laughs> And so you are told, you go to a meditation center and you're told, sit down, watch your breath. Yeah? But this is actually wrong. Yeah? And this is wrong not because I say so, because the Buddha says so. Yeah? And when you look at the sutta on the mindfulness of breathing, Anapanasati Sutta, what the Buddha says is that he says that you, first of all, you go to an empty place, yeah? a quiet place. So meditation is always about going to a quiet place, first of all. This is why you go to a meditation center where you have your own room, you can kind of be more secluded, you get out of your ordinary environment. Yeah? Then he says you set your body straight, Ujjunkayang Panidaya. So you have your body straight, because when your body is straight, basically you get more clarity of the mind. It's actually, actually, first of all, he says that you sit down, right? So sit, meditation happens when you sit down. Put your body straight, and then he says, and this is the critical thing, he says, Satting Parimukkang Upatapetra, which means having established mindfulness in front. Uh, yeah? So the idea in meditation, yeah, all of this are the preliminary things that you do before you do any meditation, yeah? before you watch the breath, uh, before you do anything at all. Uh. So you establish mindfulness first. Uh. If you start to watch the breath before you have established mindfulness, uh, it is impossible to really watch the breath in a relaxed way. Uh. Why? Because if mindfulness is not there, it means the mind is going to be, want to think, the mind wants to be, have sloth and torpor, the mind wants to do all kinds of things, but it doesn't really want to be present. Mindfulness is the definition of presence. So you have to have it first, not afterwards. Then you can watch the breath. And this is why I say, in your meditation, first of all, relax. Be at ease. Find the happiness of sitting here so that mindfulness can arise. When mindfulness has arisen, that is when you should be watching the breath, not beforehand. 
That is how you follow the instructions of the Buddha in the Anapanasati Sutta. Most people make the mistake of going to the breath straight away. That is not really how the Buddha teaches this. Sir. So get the sequence right. When you get the sequence right, you will enjoy the meditation. Get the sequence wrong, you will not enjoy the meditation because to be able to watch the breath, if you have no mindfulness, you have to use willpower. When you have, use, you have to use willpower, you will feel tight. You will feel the mind feels not comfortable, not relaxed, not at ease. And then eventually you get these famous samadhi headaches. Yeah? You have people having samadhi headaches, very famous. And that is a very bad idea to get samadhi headache. Why? Because it's very hard to unlearn that behavior and very actually can be very difficult to get rid of those headaches if you keep on doing it for long enough. So do the sequence right. Enjoy, relax, allow the mind to become peaceful. Guide the mind very gently. You will have heard I said using the word nudge during the meditation. Nudge means a very gentle um, application of the mind. Very, very gentle. You just remind yourself, okay, wow, I'm here with the BGF. All of these good people around me, the Buddha's teaching is here. Yeah, we're in the presence of the Buddha. This is really inspiring. Yeah, yeah we're doing good things together. Yeah? All of these beautiful people coming here. Yeah? And then that inspiration, that happiness, together with the, with the relaxation, allows the mindfulness to come. Then when the mindfulness comes, then you watch the breath. Yeah? I mean, this sounds very easy when I say it like this. You have to experiment a little bit to understand exactly how this works. It's going to vary a little bit from person to person. But this is essentially how the Buddha teaches meditation in the suttas. Uh, am I making any sense at all? Uh, yeah, are you sure? Yeah, okay. If I make no sense, please let me know. Uh, Venerable, I, I don't understand anything of what you say. <laughs> please. So that, that's okay as well. Uh, all right, one more question here. Yeah, last one. Good morning, Ajahn. Good morning. Yeah. Um, could you kindly repeat the website that you were mentioning about the uh, Pali translation, please? I think I've missed that. Suttacentral.net? Suttacentral.net. Sure. Yeah? Thank you. Yeah. That was a very nice question. I like that kind of question. Straightforward. Uh, no. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, Um, so this, maybe I should highlight the words I'm talking about. That's a good idea, I like that, uh, so people can see. That's, uh, that's good. Huh? Okay, so let's carry on a little bit, because we have only done one sentence of the sutta so far. Huh? <laughs> um, just to uh, remind you that uh, faith, then, is the reason why we should practice Buddhism, yeah? Uh, we don't really practice Buddhism just because it is our tradition, or it is because how we grew up, or, I mean, that's also okay, but ideally we come from this idea of confidence. Uh, and it means that we should build up these qualities and then we will be practicing in the right way from the right motivation. This is what he's, uh, the Buddha is saying here. Huh? So uh, then you go forth uh, from the lay life to homelessness. Uh, yeah? And uh, because you have gone forth in faith, uh, because you have the right attitude, yeah? because you are following the teaching of the Buddha, you are appreciating how the Buddha is teaching things, because of that, when you come together, you talk about the teachings. Yeah? This is why you come together in Buddhism. Yeah? To talk about the teachings, especially on the monastic path, in lay life is a little bit different, but on the monastic path, you talk about the teachings. Why? Well, because everything else is really like a waste of time. Yeah? You talk maybe a little bit about nice things in the world, you talk a little bit just to feel at ease and relaxed, uh, but essentially everything is really about Dhamma. How can we be inspired? How can we understand these teachings better? Uh, so why should we talk about the Dhamma? And again, there's two reasons why we should talk about the Dhamma. One is to understand what the Dhamma is about, uh, especially to understand what it is that we have to do. Yeah? So there is like the information aspect, this is how you are kind. This is how you avoid being immoral. This is how to think. This is how to direct the mind in the right way. These are the good intentions to have. Yeah? This is how you meditate. You don't watch the breath straight away. You relax first, then you watch the breath. Yeah? <laughs> These kind of things. So this is the information side. And the information side is important. But there is also the other side about the Buddhist teachings. 
And there is a nice passage in the, um, uh, in the Maha, Mahasunyata Sutta, the, longest, the longer discourse on emptiness, which is in the Majjhima Dikaya 122, and what the Buddha says that you have heard enough teachings. Now the reason why you should listen to the teaching is not just to learn more about the Dhamma, but to feel inspired about these teachings. Yeah? This is also why we listen to the teachings. So when you come to a retreat like this, these are the two things you should look for. You should look for understanding better about what the teachings are about, but hopefully also to gain some inspiration in these teachings. Yeah, things that lift you up because you understand that you are in the presence of something very powerful and very useful in your life. Yeah, so this is about listening to the Dhamma and understanding the Dhamma in the right way. And as you do that, that is when it becomes very useful for you. So, uh, so you sit together, you talk about the Dhamma, says the Buddha. And when you're sitting together, you should do one of two things. Discuss the teachings or keep noble silence. Yeah, so uh, if I suddenly go quiet, maybe it means that I've kind of had enough of teaching, now it's time for noble silence, so then we just sit quietly and see what happens. And, and it's kind of interesting. One of the things that you will uh, notice in life is that people have a tendency to fill the silence. Yeah? If you are together with someone, everyone goes silent, soon enough someone will start talking. It's almost as if they feel uncomfortable, yeah, or too much quiet, okay, better talk about something, yeah. This is a very common feeling among people in the world. Uh. But among Buddhists, there should be no problem with being silent together, yeah. Just sitting in silence is okay, yeah. And one of the beautiful things I like about someone like Ajahn Brahm, very often I sit next to Ajahn Brahm in our monastery, and when I sit next to Ajahn Brahm, often he's just silent, yeah, he doesn't say anything, yeah. And when you're with someone who is naturally silent like Ajahn Brahm, it feels very comfortable to be silent. Yeah, you can relax in that silence. I'm sure that many of you, when you have been, many of you, you are married, yeah, or, or, or whatever. And after many years of being married together, you feel at ease and you feel relaxed in the company of your husband and wife, yeah? Because you know each other well, you trust each other, you understand each other. You don't have to talk all the time anymore, yeah? And ideally, it should be a little bit like that with, with our fellow Buddhists, uh, yeah? because we know we can trust them. Uh, they are good people who won't take advantage of us. Uh, sometimes we can just sit together in silence uh, and enjoy the company of silence, knowing that this is a good way also to being together, uh, not have to talk all the time. Uh. And uh, so this is uh, something to keep in mind, instead of filling the kind of the, the vacuum, filling the emptiness that seems to arise when we don't talk. Uh, Actually, that's not really a Buddhist way of doing things. Uh, no need to fill that hole. Uh, instead, uh, silence is golden, as the old English saying goes. Uh. So, uh, you will notice here, the, also again, this beautiful word noble arises again. Uh. In Buddhism, the idea of silence is noble. Uh. Noble is an elevated quality. He has a quality which is kind of above ordinary qualities in the world. So silence is something very, um, in Buddhism, it's a very kind of a high kind of quality. It's like virtue. Yeah? It's like, um, uh, like metta. It's like karuna. All of these kind of things. Yeah? Silence is something that is very pregnant and uh, the cause very often of insight, of understanding. Yeah? It is when you are silent that understanding the world arises. It is in silence that you uh, feel a sense of profundity and depth and meaning in your life. Yeah, silence has something about it which is far more meaningful than chatter, than talking, than always being engaged with things in the world. So remember simple things like that, yeah, which is very contrary to how most people think about silence. Most people don't really like silence. But if you like silence, it means you are a more profound person than most people in the world. Uh, silence is powerful. Uh, silence is pregnant with meaning. Silence is uh, something that actually enhances our lives. Uh, so the Pali word for silence down here is tunhi bhava, being quiet. Uh. All right, so this is what the Buddha says. Uh, and then he carries on. Uh, he says, mendicants, uh, there are these two searches. Uh, 
the noble search and the ignoble search. So the word search here is called pariyasana in Pali. It means like seeking. Yeah, you are seeking something. And uh, the idea here is that all people in the world, we seek things. Yeah, I don't know if you ever consider yourself as a seeker, but one of the things that we all seek, because we all desire it, we all, dis we all seek an end of problems in our life. We all seek more happiness in our lives, more contentment, more satisfaction, more meaning, all of these positive things. And if you look into your heart, you will realize this is, this is true, right? If you look into your heart, you will see that everything that drives your life, uh, that motivates you to do anything at all, from the moment you wake up in the morning to the moment you go to bed at night, uh, all the things that drive you are a search for this ending of suffering and an increase in happiness and contentment in your life. Uh, yeah, when you get up in the morning, you, 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 uh, maybe you have breakfast or something like that, uh, do you choose a breakfast that you like, or do you choose a breakfast that you don't like? Yeah? You choose a breakfast that you like, I presume. Yeah? Anyone who chooses a breakfast they don't like? Yeah? No one, right? Uh, yeah. And if you choose a breakfast that you don't like, it means you are a masochist. Uh, yeah? And masochists, they like to not like, so still you like. Yeah? Yeah? Same, same problem, yeah? same, same issue again. Uh. So everything in our lives is driven towards this goal of seeking some kind of contentment, some kind of happiness, some kind of meaning, some kind of purpose in our existence. Uh, yeah, so this is, we are all searching for something here. Yeah. We're trying to find this thing which makes life really meaningful and purposeful. Yeah. And it's right there in your heart. Yeah. And all you have to do is look within yourself and feel that drive that always drives you towards something yeah, where you're going to find some kind of purpose and meaning here. Yeah. And the Buddha is saying here is that the way we approach this search can be divided into two different categories. Yeah. Either it can be considered a noble search, or it can be an ignoble search. And the ignoble search is like an ordinary search, is a search of ordinary people in the world. Yeah? This is a search where you haven't really considered reality properly. Yeah? You haven't really uh, looked at things carefully. You haven't investigated things properly. All you do is you follow along what everyone else in the world does. Everyone else in the world says, if you do this, if you kind of go to school, you work really hard at university, then you kind of get married, you have one and a half kids. What, what is the average now in, in Malaysia? I don't know what the average is. Whatever the, whatever the average is, you have one and a half kids, you have you know, a, a nice car, what kind of car? Proton or whatever, no, what is it called? Whatever it is that you have, you have this kind of apartment in KL, then you're going to be happy, right? Then things are going to work out, because this is what everyone else does. But actually the reality is, if you do what everyone else does, the guarantee is that you're not going to be happy, right? That's the guarantee. Because if you look at the vast majority of people in the world, the average person, are they really happy, the average person? Not really. They kind of muddle through life, they do this, they do that, they are reasonably okay, but they don't really find the meaning here. And very often when people come to the end of their life, uh, if you follow and see what happens to them, uh, they come to their deathbed, uh, and very often they are kind of okay, but they haven't really discovered anything profound. Uh, they have just gone through things, uh, and very often they wonder on the deathbed, uh, what was this all about? Uh, yeah, okay, I did all of these things. I did what everyone else said I should be doing, uh, but actually it hasn't really given anything particularly, right? Uh, I'm still kind of, haven't really gone any wise, nothing has really happened in my life. So if you just follow what everyone else does, you're going to have the same results as everyone else. And these are results that are not all that interesting. So I always say to people, be the black sheep. You want to be the black sheep? Please be the black sheep, because the white sheep, they all make the same mistake. Yeah, they follow along. The first sheep comes to the cliff, walks over the cliff. Everyone else also walks over the cliff. It is the black sheep that turns around, walks away from that cliff. So please don't be that white sheep. Instead, be the black sheep or the pink sheep. <laughs> I recently heard about someone. This was apparently an artist in Iceland. I, have you heard about Iceland? They are far away, very cold country, lots of ice, no trees. And they, but they, apparently they have sheep. 
and there was this artist in Iceland who said she would, she would, uh, she would paint all her sheep. She would paint them pink, right? Uh, and they're wondering, why do you paint them pink? Well, because these are different kind of sheep, yeah? So it was like not the black sheep, but the pink sheep, yeah? They're thinking for themselves. So maybe we should think of the pink sheep in, uh, as Buddhist, uh, or maybe the brown sheep, right, to kind of reflect the monastic robes, right? Uh, taking a different way. Maybe a black sheep is not so good. Uh. So the Buddha is like the brown sheep, yeah? He's he wearing the monastic robes, uh, and he takes a different direction. And we should follow the Buddha. We also should be brown sheep, black sheep, pink sheep, Call, you what, call it what you like, but don't be the white sheep. Actually, many of you are wearing beautiful white. I shouldn't say that, right? You are all the, all the white sheep. <laughs> it's, it's very nice to see you all wearing white, by the way. I really like that. There's kind of something about that which is very pure and very beautiful. So I really appreciate that. So I should be careful what I say here. <laughs> so you <laughs> But uh, it is the noble search begins when we dare to think differently. Yeah? And this is the idea of the uh, Buddhist idea of looking in the right place, uh, understanding that real meaning in life, you have to actually walk a different path. That is where the noble search happens. Uh, so what is this noble search? And this is what the Buddha is going to talk about now. And uh, he's going to talk about, of course, his own life before his awakening, uh, and how he was able to distinguish between the noble search and the ignoble search. And again, this uh, beautiful idea of noble, which comes in here, which I think is very, uh, very significant. Uh, the Buddha is always very good at uh, using kind of the right words to elevate the things that are important in life. So this is what he has to say. Oop, go away. So, what is the ignoble search? It is when someone who is themselves liable to be reborn uh, seeks what is also liable to be reborn. Yeah? So when someone is liable to be reborn, you seek what is also liable to be reborn. Why is that a problem? Well, that is a problem because from a Buddhist point of view, and from understanding the nature of the world, the way the world is, rebirth is problematic. Yeah? Why is rebirth problematic? Well, rebirth is problematic because we don't know where we're going to get reborn. We don't know how we're going to get reborn. We don't know how many times we're going to get reborn. And if you carry on getting reborn and doing the same thing again and again all the time, after a while, you get fed up. It's like Groundhog Day, right? A million times doing the same thing. You've had enough of doing the same thing. I sometimes think about my own life, and I have to admit, I've had a very good life. I look back on what, you know, I've had good parents, good family, good education. Uh, my family was well off. I, you know, I wasn't completely dumb dumb when I grew up. <laughs> had a bit of intelligence. I, you know, I had a few couple of girlfriends when I was young before I became a, before I became a monastic right let's be clear about that uh, <laughs> and so I, I, I basically done everything that anyone wants to do in this life but if someone were to tell me you have to do everything one more time or not one more but a thousand times again after this uh, no way I want to do it again absolutely no way it isn't that interesting and there's plenty of suffering on the way plenty of heartache plenty of problems plenty of all kind of things, uh, there's no way I would want to do it again. And I've had a really good life. Uh, what about the people who've had difficult lives? Uh, yeah. And uh, so this is the idea of rebirth. Once you start to understand what rebirth actually means, uh, once you start to understand this idea, it actually is quite repulsive. Uh, and it's quite scary when you understand the idea of samsaric existence. Uh, so the idea of being reborn, this whole concept of rebirth, is a very, very important part of Buddhism. And I'm shocked sometimes when I hear people saying that rebirth doesn't really matter. I'm shocked when I say that rebirth is just some kind of ancient idea that has no relevance in our contemporary culture. It has a massive relevance in our contemporary culture. And it's something that we should take extremely seriously. And... Um, if you take out the idea of rebirth out of the Buddhist teachings, basically the Buddhist teachings collapse. They don't exist. They cannot exist without the idea of rebirth. 
This is what gives meaning to these things. Uh. So what the Buddha is saying here, then, he's saying that uh, um, if other things are being, other things are subject to being reborn, uh, and that is already a problem, I am seeking the same thing here. Uh. Well, I'm just compounding the problem. Uh. I'm seeking these other things that already have a problem, then I follow along in the same way, I'm actually making things worse. Uh. So there's no point in seeking things that are subject to suffering, subject to problems, uh, because actually this is obviously just compounding and carrying on with the problem as it actually is. Uh. So um, this is what is going on here. Now, I want to just discuss very briefly this translation here uh, of rebirth, yeah? because the Pali word is the word over here. You can see the word jati damo. And the word jati is the word that is translated as rebirth. Dhamma is translated as liable. Yeah, liable is dhamma, jati is re, uh, rebirth. And perhaps you think that jati means birth, it doesn't mean rebirth. So why does Bhante Sujato translate it as rebirth in this, this particular case? And the answer is that remember we are here in a particular culture in ancient India. And in the ancient Indian culture, if you are born, it means you are also reborn. Right? There is no real distinction between birth and rebirth. Every time someone is born is also an instance of rebirth. So when you teach the ancient Indian audience, you teach them about birth, what they will hear when you hear the word birth, they will hear rebirth. And because they hear rebirth, but we don't hear that, if you want to bring that out in translation, you have to translate as rebirth. Otherwise, uh, you're losing some of the meaning that the original audience would have heard. This, to me, is a right way of translating. You have to translate in a way whereby you carry over the meaning that the original audience would have heard. Uh, yeah? So jati, meaning rebirth here, is actually a correct way of translating this. Uh. Now... So that is the first point that I just want to make about the idea of uh, the word jati. Now the other thing which is very interesting here, right? Uh, the Buddha uh, is talking about rebirth uh, as if he considers it a reality, yeah? as if he considers it something that is true. But he's not yet enlightened at this point. Uh, so how can the Buddha have known at this point that there was such a thing as rebirth? Yeah, it seems to be an assumption that he's making, right? He's not enlightened yet. He hasn't had his profound insights into reality. So is he just taking on the ideas of the Indian culture? Or is he having insight into the idea of rebirth? Now this is a very important point. It's a very important point because very often when people dismiss the idea of rebirth, what they, what they do is that they argue that the Buddha would just take on board the ideas of the contemporary culture, right? And then those people who disagree with that, they will say, well, the Buddha actually investigated uh, and he discovered, the idea, he discovered the nature of rebirth uh, on his night of awakening. Uh. So there's two different ideas. They're contrasting with, contrasting with each other. On the one hand, the idea that the Buddha took it on from the culture. On the other hand, the idea that he understood it through his own insight. So which one of these is correct? And they are both correct, right? And this is what is fascinating here. They're both correct because what we are seeing here, we're seeing actually the idea of the Buddha basically assuming that the idea of rebirth is true. He is not the Buddha yet. He's still the Buddha to be. He's trying to understand the nature of reality, but he hasn't yet understood it. And in the meantime, he has to make certain assumptions. It's the same with all of us, right? If I ask you, is, do you believe in rebirth? You probably say yes. If you say no, that's okay. You don't <laughs> that's fine. But many of you will say yes because you've been Buddhist for a long time. But you also know that it is just a belief. You don't know it yet. In the meantime, it is just a belief until you come to know these things. And so we all have to have a starting point. We have to make certain assumptions. And the assumption of the Buddha, because it doesn't yet know, is that there is rebirth. It is a part of the understanding of that society in ancient India that there is rebirth. And Buddha takes that thing on board. But, and this is the critical thing, even though the Buddha takes it on board temporarily as a kind of preliminary understanding of the world, 
he also understands, I don't know this for sure. I have to investigate it down the line. And because he knows that on his night, on the, before his final awakening, he then does recall his past lives. He goes into that kind of samadhi which is required to remember his past lives, and then he verifies it for himself that there is such a thing as rebirth. Yeah? So both sides of the equation are required. There's always, always a requirement of confidence to begin with, and then there is a requirement of verification down the track. Yeah? Yeah? And it's the same thing with us in the same way. The way we should proceed with the Dhamma, which is start out with a degree of confidence and faith in these teachings. If the Buddha said there is rebirth, okay, I should take it seriously, right? It must be very important. And then you, but you also know that this is not really knowledge, this is not really full understanding on your path. So down the track, we hope to verify this through the way we think about this and through the way we have investigate these teachings and ultimately have insight into them. So this gives a more nuanced idea of the idea of uh, how the Buddha looked at the world. Uh, it is not just either he took on board the existing ideas uh, or he had insight. Actually, it's a bit of both. Uh, and that is really what is happening here. Uh, so this is the... Uh, ignoble search, right? When you are liable to be reborn and you seek other things that are liable to be reborn. Instead of solving the problem that is at hand, you compound the problem and make it worse. So. And then it goes on. Instead of, so here he says, themselves liable to grow old, to fall sick, to die to sorrow, to become corrupted, the seek what is also liable to these things. So uh, again, so far we only had a look at rebirth. Uh, here we have all of these other kind of downsides of existence that you have to become old. Yeah, you have you have to become sick. I'm going to discuss all of these things a little bit later on. Uh, you have to die, yeah, everything ends in death, all the happiness that you had in life will have to end in death, you have to be separated from everything. Yeah. And then we have this couple of other things here that are added, that are kind of particular to this particular sutta. Uh, sorrow, uh, yeah, sorrow is part of human existence. Uh, if you have been reborn, you're going to have sorrow, you're going to have grief. This is just what life is like. Yeah. And then you have this idea of becoming corrupted here at the very end. Uh, which is also a kind of an interesting thing. If you are a human being, if you're living in this world, you are going to become corrupted. <laughs> does that feel bad or does it feel good? It feels bad, right? We don't want to be corrupted. We would rather be pure-hearted. I don't know about you, but I'd rather be pure-hearted than corrupted. But actually, it is not your choice. You are going to be corrupted if you have been born as a human being. Are you ready to be corrupted? <laughs> Don't really want that, right? Corruption feels dodgy. But corruption here in Buddhism just means that your heart is being uh, corrupted by all of these negative qualities of the mind. They are the qualities of greed and ill will and these kind of things. These are the corruptions. And unless we do something about this, unless we practice a path that counteracts these tendencies, they will have a tendency to grow inside of you. So if you want to overcome the corruptions within, and when you get corrupted, you become lower as a human being. Corruption has this feeling about that you feel less worthy. You feel less self-esteem because you have all of these negative qualities inside. I don't know about how you feel about yourself when you have a lot of anger and greed and these kind of things, but the usual feeling is that you feel kind of, you don't feel good about yourself. But when your mind is very pure, when your mind is very bright, when you feel joy because of the Dhamma, it kind of lifts you up. You feel a sense of purity and it elevates you as a human being. So we want to avoid this kind of corruptions as well. I'll talk a bit more about this later on as we go through this. So these are the things that are bad qualities, right? All of these things are things that we would rather avoid. These are things that are called suffering in life. 
And when we are subject to all of these kind of sufferings, we go out and we seek other things that are subject to exactly the same thing. It's called an ignoble path because we are compounding the problem. We're making things worse. Instead of finding a solution to suffering in the world, we're making the suffering worse. So if you want to find a solution, we have to look somewhere else. This is really what the Buddha is saying here. So um, let us look at this in a little bit more detail, all of these kind of uh, uh, problems here. And what should be described as liable to be reborn? And the Buddha says partners and children, male and female bond servants, Goats and sheep, chickens and pigs, elephants and cattle are liable to be reborn. Yeah, so this is fairly obvious. So here you have uh, the various kind of things that are liable to be reborn. Partners and children. Partners means like, you know, uh, like your husband or wife or boyfriend or girlfriend or whatever. Partners. Yeah, they're going to die or they're going to be reborn down the track. Yeah, so they have still stuck in this samsaric existence. Uh, children, same problem. Uh, yeah, Male and female bond servants. Bond servants is just a fancy term for slave, really. Uh, or uh, maybe not quite slave, but uh, something similar to a slave. Uh, goats and sheep. We have all of these animals coming up next. Uh, and, of course, animals, too, are part of the samsaric existence. They, too, will have to be reborn down the track. Yeah? So all of these things are reborn. And uh, you may wonder, why are these things spoken about? And uh, the reason why these things are spoken about in this way is because all of these animals that are mentioned here, these are the things that were considered uh, part of wealth in ancient India. If you were a wealthy person, you would have all of these kind of animals. Uh, yeah, this is kind of how the ancient Indian society worked. And if you were, if you were asked about, um, uh, if you were asked about uh, how wealthy you are, uh, very often you would count your cattle. Yeah, the amount of cattle that you had uh, would would equate to how wealthy you were. Uh, so, for example, the Brahmins they would have so and so many heads of cattle, uh, and that would kind of equate to your wealth. This is kind of the idea of wealth. Uh, but this wealth you have is subject to being reborn. It is subject to samsaric existence. It will carry on in the same way, re-dying, re-being reborn, carrying on into the future in this way. So all of these things are then kind of subject to the same problem as you have. And so this is not the way out of the problem. It is compounding the same problem that we have already. This is the idea of being subject to rebirth. So I've talked quite a bit about the idea of a rebirth already uh, in terms of what it is like here, so I will just leave it at that for, for now. Um, these attachments uh, are liable to be reborn. Yeah, so uh, the uh, uh, Pali word for attachment here is upadaya. You see it down here. Yeah, and upadaya means like... Uh, Things that you own, in a sense. And upadaya is a word that is used in the suttas to mean anything that you think you own. It can mean all of these living beings. It can also mean anything else in your life. It also includes like the five khandas. In other words, the five things that make up a, per a person. That's also a kind of upadaya, because we take this as being part of uh, what we own in this world. Yeah. So these attachments are liable to be reborn. Uh, and so we go out into the world uh, and we attach to things. Uh, yeah? We buy into things. We hold on to them uh, and we try to keep them as ours, even though we know we can never hold on to these things. Why? Because they're liable to be reborn. Uh, they're liable to carry on. They're liable to kind of carry on through their own journey in samsara. So we're trying to hold on to things that are inherently unhold onable. Uh, and this is what we are seeing here. Uh. Is attachment are liable to be reborn? Someone who is tied, infatuated, and attached to such things, themselves liable to be, to be reborn, seeks what is also liable to be reborn. Yeah, so you are tied, yeah, 
uh, gattito, uh, infatuated. Infatuated means like you are intoxicated almost, right? You are in love with, you are, uh, you, these, these things are dear to you. They go, they go to your heart, right? They are important to you. Uh. And then ajapanno, here, attached to. Uh. So you have this kind of very close, a profound emotional relationship to these things, uh, like we all have. Yeah, we have close emotional relationship to our partners, to our children. Uh, uh, too many of the things that we own in this world is all about ownership. Uh, and the closer, the more attached you are to these things, uh, it means that you are searching or you are holding on to the things that actually lead to more problems in life. Uh, so there's a very kind of useful. Uh, thought right there, yeah, this, uh, uh, this um, um, reminder uh, that when we attach to all of these things in our life that are very powerful to us, that are very meaningful to us uh, on a kind of ordinary level, actually we are doing something that actually is problematic down the track. Yeah? So one of the benefits then of the spiritual path is that gradually we are loosening some of these ties. Yeah? some of the infatuation, some of the attachments that we have, uh, some of the problems that we find with these things, the ties are gradually being loosened, uh, they're gradually being cut, uh, and we are unchaining ourselves uh, from this whole process of samsaric existence. Uh, and this is kind of the idea here. Uh, we are no longer buying into this idea of uh, holding on to the things that are being reborn in the world. Uh. So, uh, yeah. So that is the uh, beginning of this uh, idea of the ignoble search uh, and the noble search for what is being uh, reborn, and it's only really the, uh, the first one. Uh, usually, when the Buddha talks about the noble search, uh, uh, what you may remember when you think about the suttas overall, uh, the Buddha often talks about the divine messengers. Uh, yeah, there's a kind of a very famous phrase in the suttas, the Devaduta. Devaduta are like the messengers coming from the heavenly realms, uh, reminding us of the dangers of life. Uh, and usually the Devadutas are things like, you know, sickness, old age, and death. These are us the usual kind of Devadutas. The fourth one then is the kind of ascetic sometimes, uh, which reminds us of the alternative path. Uh, and usually the way that this is phrased, there's a well-known sutta in the Angutra 3, it's called the Sukumala Sutta, which is about how the Buddha was brought up in great comfort, uh, and then he saw and he, re and he reflected on old age, sickness, and death, and that is actually what made the Buddha go forth according to that particular sutta. So these are like the main ideas that kind of made the Buddha go forth, yeah? especially sickness, old age, and death. Uh, these are the three main things. Uh, yeah, this is what you see again and again in the suit, as in a number of places. Uh, but here we have the idea of rebirth, right? Uh, and the idea of rebirth is actually much more rare as part of this process. Uh, and it is really only found in this particular sutta. So it's important to remember what the main issues are. The main issues is not rebirth. Uh, and the reason why rebirth is not the main issue is because rebirth is, after all, in the realm of confidence, in the realm of faith. Yeah, you don't know about rebirth. You don't know if this is true. It, of course, from the Buddha's point of view, it is true. But what we can relate to very directly, what is immediately meaningful to each one of us, are the ideas of sickness, old age, and death. These are things that we can know for sure, because we see them around us at all times. And so these are the most significant ideas. Why rebirth is added here, it is possible, I don't know this, it is possible that this have maybe been added later on. It may be a later addition. It could also be that it is added here just to expand on the basic ideas of old age, sickness and death, right? Because this is limited in a certain way. So it could be an expansion on that. Or it is a possibly also a later addition. It's very hard to really be sure what is going on but probably it is more like an expansion to kind of bring out a broader idea. So remember, this is kind of an important distinction in the Sutta. The Buddha tends to focus on things that are immediate and tangible. And what is immediate and tangible are the things that we can observe in our own lives. 
And then sometimes he adds to that ideas that we have to take on board on faith and confidence to bring out a broader picture of things. The problem with just focusing on illness, old age and death is that it's all limited to this life. But the idea of rebirth brings out this panoramic idea of existence. When we see existence in its much larger context, and when you see existence in a larger context, it also brings in an additional sense of meaning. Yeah, yeah it brings in the meaning of, of kind of this um, panoramic view, which actually, um, if you think about it in the right way, it actually gives an enhanced incentive to practice the spiritual path. And that is why it is also part of this thing that we call the noble path, contra the ignoble path, uh, understanding the idea of rebirth in this way. Yeah. So focus on the things that are immediately obvious to you, uh, and then those things that are not immediately obvious, uh, try to uh, gain some sort of understanding and confidence, make them real in your own life. Uh, and I will talk more about this later on, how to make these ideas real. Uh, and then I think we are kind of bringing together many different sides of this whole thing. Uh, and then hopefully uh, it will give rise to some kind of uh, um, noble, nobleness uh, in our practice. Uh, of the spiritual path. All right, so um, I'm going to stop there.